Welcome to the video series, The Operational Amplifier, From Abstraction to Reality. This video is about operating op amps on single power supplies and the various issues that arise when doing so. Back in the infancy of the operational amplifier, dual split supplies were used. It took plus and minus 300 volts to operate those things. Fast forward, the operational amplifier is still best suited with dual power supplies. The principal advantage of dual power supplies is their common connection to ground provides a stable, low impedance, zero reference. Although it is advantageous to implement op amp circuits with balanced dual supplies, there are many practical applications where, for energy conservation or other reasons, single supply operation is necessary or desirable. For example, the battery power in automotive and marine equipment provides only a single polarity. Aircraft power often has a 28 volt DC power supply available. Personal battery powered consumer goods are ubiquitous. Even line powered equipment such as computers may only have a single polarity built in supply, furnishing plus 5 volts or plus 12 volts DC for the system. Let's start with the non inverting amplifier configuration. It should be easy to operate it on a single supply. Just connect the positive rail to the positive DC source and connect the negative rail to ground. We will just capacitively couple the inputs and the outputs. Well, there are major problems with doing this. First, the input current is on the order of picoamps, and it would take hours for the input capacitor to settle. Therefore, we need a bias supply there at the input. But even if we did, the amplifier has DC gain so any DC bias on the input will get amplified as well. This is the wrong approach to a single supply operation. Before we go any further, let's review the basics of capacitively coupling AC signals. I know this is very basic, but it needs to be understood. For example, we have an AC source that is 2 volts peak to peak and is symmetrical around ground at plus 1 volt peak and minus 1 volt peak. If we capacitively couple this into a resistor tied to a plus 10 volt DC bias source, the AC signal will average around that 10 volt bias from plus 9 volts to plus 11 volts. Similarly, if I tied the resistor to a minus 10 volt DC bias, the signal will go from minus 9 volts peak to minus 11 volts peak. This method is sometimes called bias injection. If the output of an amplifier has a DC bias of 6 volts and the signal goes from plus 5 volts peak to 7 volts peak, capacitively coupling that signal to a resistor tied to ground restores the signal symmetrically across ground again. Since most signals require symmetry, a middle voltage needs to be derived from Vs as a Vs divided by 2 to ensure symmetrical maximum dynamic range for both input and output signals. This will work, but it makes the input susceptible to noise from the power supply. Any power supply noise will get directly coupled onto the input signal. Another problem is that with half the voltage supply at the non-inverting input, this amplifier configuration has DC gain and the input DC bias will get amplified and saturate the output. The problem of amplifying the DC bias can be fixed by using a capacitor in the feedback network here. This means at DC the amplifier is effectively a unity gain buffer, and the DC on the output is also Vs over 2. Ultimately, a voltage regulator programmed to half the supply voltage would be the best option for a low noise, low impedance bias source. But of course, this takes up room, consumes power, and adds cost. A Zener diode regulator can also be used. Just select a Zener voltage as close as possible to half of Vs. This consumes extra power as well. An op amp voltage follower makes a great bias source having a low impedance output 
Most top amps come in dual or quad configurations, so having an extra is handy. For biasing a single supply op amp, a more convenient, low cost method for a bias source exists in the form of a voltage divider whose output must be filtered with a large capacitor CB to make the VS over 2 less sensitive to power supply noise and therefore maintaining a decent power supply rejection. Starting with the filtered voltage divider, it's a simple RC low pass filter transfer function. The Thevenin equivalent resistance is the resistors in parallel. The pole cutoff frequency for this bias network is when the capacitive reactance equals the Thevenin resistance. Next is the input capacitive coupling. Its transfer function is a simple RC high pass filter response. The pole cutoff frequency for this input stage is when the input capacitive reactance equals the input resistance. The trick we are using to make the amplifier have no gain at DC gives us a transfer function that is not like a simple RC high pass filter. Let's analyze it. I'm calling Z1 the RG and CG in series and Z2 as just RF. Using the gain equation for the non-inverting amplifier, the transfer function comes out to this. By observation, the pole frequency includes the combination of RG and CG, and there is a zero with the sum of the resistors and CG. The ratio of the pole frequency to the zero frequency mathematically comes out to be equal to the AC gain. Therefore, the pole frequency will be the zero frequency times the gain. The total frequency response will be the input capacitive coupling network transfer function times the amplifier transfer function, which is the cascade of the functions. Expressing the transfer functions in their generic forms gives us this. And here is the magnitude function. We want to make the input stage pole frequency equal the amplifier stage pole frequency. We can replace the zero frequency with the ratio of the amplifier pole frequency over the AC gain, A0. Our goal is to determine the relationship between the total circuit cutoff frequency and the cutoff frequencies of both the input circuit and amplifier. We will set the magnitude to the minus 3 dB point which is the gain divided by the square root of 2, and replace F with the FCT, the total cutoff frequency. Solving for FCT gives us this. We can see when a zero is large, the total cutoff frequency is 1.55 times the pole frequencies of the input stage and the amplifier, of which we have set to be the same. So let's go design this. If you want to get more precise at lower gains, you can calculate the exact ratio of the total circuit pole frequency versus the pole frequencies of each stage using this equation. Here are the design requirements. The power supply will be plus 5 volts. The passband gain is 100 or 40 dB. The minimum bandwidth or low end cutoff frequency is 16 Hz and the input impedance is 100K. We will let the quiescent divider current be 50 microamps, which gives us a value for RB as 50K. It's common practice to let the bias filter frequency be one tenth or less than the total cutoff frequency. So for 1.6 Hertz, CB comes out to four microfarads. We will just select the next highest standard value of 4.7 microfarads. We already established the total cutoff frequency relative to the pole frequencies of the input stage and the amplifier stage. We set both it to be equal. 16 hertz divided by 1.55 gives us 10.3 hertz. For a gain of 100, the ratio of RF to RG is 99, so we will let RF be 100K and RG be 1.01K. It's time to set the amplifier pole frequency 
to 10.3 Hz, giving us 15 microfarads for CG. With the input impedance requirement of 100K, we will let Rn equal 100K. And finally, setting the input capacitor for a pole frequency of 10.3 Hz gives us a value of 0.15 microfarads for Cn. Now let's look at the individual stage responses along the total frequency response. First, the amplifier transfer function. The 3 dB cutoff frequency is at 10.3 Hz. Here's the input stage transfer function, of which we made its 3 dB cutoff frequency to be 10.3 Hz too. Now for the cascaded transfer function. Notice the total cutoff frequency is near the 16 Hz we designed it for and has the 1.55 relationship to the individual cutoff pole frequencies. Here's the response of the bias filter of which we set its pole frequency to 1.6 Hz. At 16 Hz we get a 26 dB noise reduction and out at 1 kHz we get over 60 dB of noise reduction. Now we will cover the inverting configuration which is greatly simplified. The non-inverting input receives the middle supply bias directly and the input signal comes into CN. We will call Z1 the series combination of CN and RN and Z2 is RF. Using the standard gain equation of Z2 over Z1 we get this simple single pole high pass filter function. The pole frequency is when the reactance of the capacitor equals the input resistor. This is a quick, easy design. The specs are the same as our previous example, using a 5 volt power supply, passband gain of 100, a minimum bandwidth of 16 hertz, and an input impedance of 1K. The bias supply is exactly the same as the non-inverting configuration. It can go directly into the non-inverting input. With a gain of 100, the ratio of RF to RN is 100. The input impedance is 1K, so RN will be 1K, and RF will be 100K. With a pole frequency of 16 Hz, the input capacitor comes out to about 10 microfarads. Here's the simple single pole response of 20 dB per decade. We designed a bias filter to reject power supply noise with a very low cutoff frequency. Consequently, that bias voltage can take considerable time to settle. The time constant of 25K and 4.7 microfarads is about 120 milliseconds. This may take 300 to 500 milliseconds for the output to settle. If startup needs to be short, use a linear regulator for the V-middle supply. If you desire to remove the bias from the output, capacitively couple the output to a load resistor connected to ground. This will act as a high pass filter again. Select the pole frequency as desired. The output signal will average above and below ground. Also, check the input common mode range and output range of the selected op amp. That's always a limit, especially when supply voltages are low. A rail to rail op amp may be needed. Thanks for watching. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming content.